All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Liz Schaller. I'm the NIMAC manager, and I'm presenting to you part two of our publisher and vendor training series where we really um, go into best practices and um, resources for creating NIMAS files. Um, this session is being recorded, and we will post the recording as well as the slides from today's presentation on our website. We'll send a, a, an email out when, when that is made available to you on the website. But thank you so much for being here this morning and I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm going to go somewhat quickly through the slides, but we will pause several times for questions because there is quite a bit to cover this morning. Um, and at the top, we're going to talk about the key resources that you should be consulting when you produce NIMAS files. Uh, then we'll get into NIMAS metadata. We always have a lot of questions and back and forth, especially with our new publishers on metadata. So we'll cover some of those topics. Then we'll get into some best practices for tagging your XML files, as well as some best practices for optional NIMAS content like alt text and MathML. Um, and finally, we'll wrap up with some additional resources. Okay, so diving into the key resources, the, the documents that you should be consulting as you prepare NIMAS files. There are really three essential resources for preparing NIMAS, and these include the NIMAS 1.1 specification, the DAISY structure guidelines, as well as our NIMAC metadata guidelines. All of those are linked in the slides here, and Alexa is, um, is with us today, our NIMAC librarian, and she's also putting links in the chat for you as well. The NIMAS uh, 1.1 is the only file format that the NIMAC can accept. We talked about that in our part one training. And NIMAS is a subset of DAISY. And each file set, each NIMAS file set, includes all of the text from the source book supplied in an XML file, uh, an OPF that includes the required metadata and the file set manifest, so the, the list of images in the file set a PDF that includes only the title page and or covers and the copyright page, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as all of the images from the print book supplied as separate image files, and these can be supplied um, as JPEG, PNG, or SVG format. The NIMAS 1.1 baseline element set must be used to tag the textbook content, and uh, this set includes document level tags like DT book and head tag and book tag, as well as um, structuring and hierarchy tags. So you have um, levels and headers one through six. You'll have um, front matter, body matter, and rear matter sections, um, as well as table tags, image tags, and block and inline elements. And some of those uh, block and inline elements, those might be like a, a block quote or a list or a list item um, or a sidebar, a glossary tags, um, some inline elements might be, you know, emphasis, bold line breaks, um, page numbers, that sort of thing. Um, and if any of the baseline elements that doesn't look familiar, we do advise that you review the spec to ensure that you're using the tagging set fully. It's important to be familiar with both the specification and the DAISY structure guidelines to ensure that content is tagged correctly. And one thing that we do want to note is that our automated validation can't detect whether specific content is tagged correctly. So um, our NIMAC team staff, as we're reviewing the files, we may require resubmission um, if a file review or if user feedback identifies tagging errors. It is important to note that the NIMAS specification doesn't explicitly reference attributes that are required in conjunction with the baseline element set. So uh, for example, when using the page num tags, the page and ID attributes must also be used. So please be sure to review the DAISY structure guidelines to ensure that you're not only correctly using the element set, but also incorporating any required attributes. Okay, let's talk about the other files in the NIMAS file set. So the NIMAS file set must include an OPF, and that includes required metadata, a manifest of all of the files in the file set, and a spine referencing the XML file. 
Metadata requirements and guidance are provided in the NIMAC metadata guidelines document. And we don't, do want to note that if you're providing MathML in your file, then fallback images must also be supplied in the file set and referenced in the OPF manifest. Now, the PDF that's included in the NIMAS file set is not the PDF of the entire book. It is for file review and cataloging purposes only, and it should always include the title page and copyright page, and possibly also the covers when needed. The way that that's determined is that there is certain information that must be present in the NIMAS PDF, and that includes the complete title. And we do find that sometimes the complete title information is only found on the cover of a book, not on the title page. So in those instances, we would require the cover to be submitted in the PDF as well. Um, the ISBNs also need to be present in the PDF, as well as the publisher imprint and the copyright statement. So those are the required pieces of information that need to be present in the NIMAS PDF. And if you are a publisher that produces digital instructional materials, you'll know that sometimes we have to work with you and your vendor to produce uh, a, an identifying PDF that's actually not part of the um, digital instructional material itself. It's produced just for NIMAS. Um, and that includes that key information. It's for identif file identification purposes. Now, the PDF that's supplied in the NIMAS file set is not used in the production of any accessible format, so uh, it doesn't need to be a production quality file. And large PDF files can add to file processing and downloading times without adding any value to the NIMAC user. So we do ask that uh, PDFs for NIMAS should only be a few megabytes in size. And if your process is generating large PDFs, please go ahead and resave those as uh, smaller files for your NIMAS package. All right, now image files, that the, the final component of your NIMAS file set. Um, the specification requires that all images be pre that are present in the source book be supplied as separate image files in an images folder. And again, SVG, PNG, or JPEG formats are accepted. Images supplied with NIMAS must be 300 DPI at their original size and resolution. This is essential for uh, producing large print for the usability of images. Um, now, what determines image quality in NIMAS is publishers providing high quality PDFs or other production files to vendors so that the high resolution images can be extracted for the NIMAS file set. So if you're a vendor, please don't resave low resolution images as 300 DPI to meet the DPI requirement. Um, resaving the images in that way will result in blurry images. So, and we do review the images when we receive NIMAS files. That's something that has to be reviewed manually. Um, our validation wizard does not check for that automatically, but we will require resubmission of low quality images, um, even if the image file properties show 300 DPI. So we will take a look at the images and make sure that they're usable for large print production. And we may require resubmission if, if they are not. This is that is also something that we occasionally do hear from users about, and so it may be a case where we didn't catch that some of the images um, were blurry um, or not appropriate for enlargement until it, the file is actually used for large print production, and then we'll hear from a user. And at that point, we may reach back out and request that the images um, be replaced in the file set. Another thing that's important to note here is that text should not be supplied as image files for NIMAS. And it's also not acceptable to supply whole pages as image files. We do see this from time to time. So even if text is provided embedded in an image file in the print book, the NIMAS specification does require that text be captured in the XML file. Text that is kind of integral to an image, such as a, a label of a part of a diagram, should ideally be captured as alt text or in a uh, production note or caption tag. And if you have questions on how to best capture text supplied in an image, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at, at nimac at aph.org. We're always happy to help answer questions about that. 
Uh, and for those of you who may wish to go beyond the baseline requirements for NIMAS, there are other options um, to improve your files, and those include providing MathML for math and scientific notation. We'll talk a little later about um, MathML tagging, but basically that would that is um, tagging uh, your math expressions in the XML itself, um, rather than providing all of the math as images in your file. And um, MathML is, can be processed by some um, Braille transcription softwares and other softwares, and so it can help to speed up the process of accessible format creation. Uh, it's also desirable, though not required, to supply alt text for images and uh, production notes for longer descriptions of images, uh, as well as using the full DAISY element set in XML tagging. And we did want to uh, mention quickly here that um, because the NIMAS technical specification is a part of uh, IDEA 2004 uh, in the regulations, it can only be changed through legislative or regulatory action. And over the past year, we have been conducting intensive outreach to stakeholders. Uh, we sent out surveys back in the fall. We held a meeting at ATIA. We've had focus groups. And uh, we had, in May, an in-person convening um, with some publishers in attendance, as well as some accessible media producers and um, authorized users of the NIMAC um, to gain their input about possible changes to the specification. And if you participated in any of these activities, we greatly appreciate um, you spending some time uh, to share your thoughts with us. We're currently working through all of that information uh, and producing a report of our recommended updates, which we will present to the Department of Education. Okay, that was a lot of information. So I'll go ahead and pause here. And uh, Nicole Gaines, our project director is also uh, on the call with us this morning. She's feeling a little under the weather from a conference, but she is here and can maybe uh, chime in as well if you have any questions. I am not seeing anything in the chat list. Wonderful. Okay, well then we'll keep it moving. So next, let's uh, dive into the DAISY structure guidelines. So in addition to using the prescribed tags, it is also uh, required for tagging of content for NIMAS to be done in accordance with the DAISY structure guidelines. So I would hope that everyone on the call today has, has uh, consulted the DAISY structure guidelines before. Following these guidelines does help ensure that your files are tagged correctly and will be usable in producing accessible formats. And automated validation can't evaluate adherence to the structure guidelines. So um, some of the things that we talk about are things that actually the NIMAC staff will catch as part of our file review process. You can utilize the guidelines um, either by working from the major structural elements or from the index of elements. And you can locate guidance for XML tagging by reviewing major structural elements like levels, uh, syntax, class attributes, um, and then, you know, your, your key um, pieces of, of your book, your front matter, your body matter, and your end matter. And the DAISY structure guidelines also provides an alphabetical index of elements. Uh, and this can be used to locate all elements and attributes included in the DAISY specification. Uh, this is something that our team utilizes all of the time uh, when we're reviewing files or have questions that come up. So for each element, the index entry includes a definition, the syntax, as well as some examples. And I'll show you an example here on the screen of the entry for sidebar. So you can see here, uh, you have the definition of sidebar. It'll give you the syntax, how, how um, the tag should be used and what can be nested within them. Uh, and then there'll usually be a couple of examples um, of how you might tag, uh, tag a sidebar or whatever information object you're looking at. And as I mentioned, automated validation can't detect um, everything. Um, so if issues are found in the manual file review, we will require cor corrections to be made. 
And if you do have any questions about how to correctly tag specific content, please don't hesitate to reach out. Typically when we provide feedback, we will link to the, um, the relevant sections of the DAISY structure guidelines for things like a table of contents tagging or glossary tagging. But we're also happy to answer questions if you have maybe something that is a little unusual and you're not totally sure how to handle it. We're always happy to help with that. All right, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about uh, NIMIS metadata. All NIMIS files must include required metadata in the OPF of the file set. And metadata review is an important part of the file certification process. It's one of the key things that um, our NIMAC team does when we're reviewing your files. Now, we have produced the NIMAC metadata guidelines. I think these were most recently updated in June of this year. So they are uh, the most recent updates are relatively new. So if you haven't looked at the guidelines recently, you may want to go um, go and pull that down. I think Alexa shared the, the link in the chat. And they provide detailed instructions for meeting the metadata requirements for NIMAC files. Now, one thing that's very important to keep in mind is that um, the NIMAC system does have a search, which is how your customers are going to find NIMAC files. And they can search for title, author, series, um, ISBN, or identifier, as well as utilize the search filters that we have in the NIMAC system. Our search is not a Google search, and we don't have a full text search of the system in every field. Um, it is a good search, but again, it is limited to just those fields. So metadata accuracy and completeness are essential. Um, we're especially concerned with making sure that all ISBNs that are present on your material are found in your, in your metadata, as well as all elements of your title. Sometimes this can get a little tricky, especially if it's a very long title with multiple subtitles um, or units, et cetera. And, um, you know, we'll typically work with your vendor or you to make sure that for, for your programs that you're submitting, that everything is kind of formatted in the same way uh, to make sure that things are findable if, um, if if your user is searching by maybe just that that subtitle or you know whatever is coming to mind for them when they're looking in the NIMAC. The metadata is supplied in the PDF, or, or, excuse me, in the OPF is automatically extracted upon upload to create the NIMAC system record for the file. And not including required metadata can cause this extraction and your upload to fail. And um, this is the case whether you manually upload the file or deliver it by FTP. When reviewing the file metadata, we check the metadata against the cover, title page, and copyright page PDF, as mentioned earlier, um, that is a key part of the NIMAS file set. We utilize standard library cataloging practices. So we check to ensure that the metadata supplied matches the book and that the XML file reflects the same information. We do often see some mis mismatch between um, the title information, maybe that the entire title page has not been transcribed in the XML. Um, maybe there's a mismatch between um, the doc author that was tagged uh, in the XML and what's supplied in the metadata. So we do check to verify that everything um, is complete and accurate. And even if a publisher uses different metadata internally to track items, the print book itself is the authoritative source for NIMAS metadata. Our team routinely make minor metadata corrections at the point of file review so that files can be certified. Um, I'd say this happens, you know, quite frequently. And these corrections are automatically saved to the system and to the OPF. However, uh, we might require that metadata be corrected by the vendor if there are multiple errors present or an issue affects a large number of files. And especially when we're um, you're beginning to submit a new program, we want to make sure that the vendor um, corrects all of the issues so that going forward, the rest of the files for that program are submitted with the, um, the metadata formatted correctly. 
So again, please do review the NIMAC metadata guidelines, especially if you're new to the NIMAC or if you just haven't taken a look at them in a while um, or when you have questions about how to include correct metadata. If you're a publisher, please ensure that your vendors receive all of the metadata that's needed to prepare the NIMAC OPF. Um, sometimes, and again, it depends on the situation, but um, if there are multiple metadata issues or maybe we need clarification on series or program information, we will often copy the publisher as well as the vendor when we reach out with um, file feedback so that the publisher can also chime in on that information. I did want to mention, and, and this is actually why the metadata guidelines document was recently updated. Earlier this year, we implemented two minor changes to the metadata to simplify our requirements. One is that publisher place was removed as a requirement. So this metadata is no longer used in the system and is okay if it remains in your file. It just gets disregarded. Um, and then the second is that numerical edition is now only indicated using the NIMAS source edition tag. So that DC terms description version tag is now used only for national and state edition. It's not used um, in duplicate to provide the numerical edition information as well. So an updated version of the validation wizard was released in uh, February of 2024 to reflect these changes. If you had the wizard installed on your computer at that time, you should have been automatically prompted to update it. Um, if you weren't or you're not certain um, if your wizard is up to date, you can actually see the version information on the wizard itself. When you open the screen, it will it should have that 2.5.6 version information listed there. But you can always uh, log into your NIMAC account and download the wizard at any time from the resources tab. Um, and again, at this time, any unnecessary tags will be disregarded by the system but we do encourage you to incorporate the changes into your workflow. We do always welcome metadata queries and we're happy to provide guidance related to individual titles or to programs. Some vendors send us um, sample metadata when they're getting ready to submit a new program to us. And so we can provide feedback before they even begin submitting the files. And we're always happy to do that. You can email us at nimac at aph.org. Typically, you should provide the, uh, the that title and copyright page PDF and your um, metadata as you plan to format it um, in the body of the email, and then we'll um, we'll help address any questions or concerns. This I, again is an especially useful process for creating an OPF template for different components of a new program. Um, we're, we're happy to do it for individual titles as well, but I think for new programs, that's typically when we get the, the metadata queries and we're happy to help with those. We did, um, I think Nicole briefly mentioned in um, the first session of our two-part series that we offer a free tool within the system for generating correctly tagged and formatted OPF metadata. So we do encourage you to explore this option, especially if you're preparing a very large program for delivery. To use the Excel to OPF tool, simply download the metadata template from the resources tab of your NIMAC account. And I want to note that the metadata template has been updated to reflect the changes I just mentioned about uh, publisher place and the um, source edition tagging. We want to fill in one line of the sheet for each OPF you need and then upload it using the transform Excel to OPF menu option. The system will immediately email you a zip file that includes a starter OPF for every item included in your Excel sheet. The starter OPF will contain all the correctly tagged and formatted metadata, but it will not yet be complete. You will still need to add the manifest and spine portions of the OPF. Once you've done that, your file will be ready to use in your NIMAS file set. Okay, that was a lot of information. I'll I'll uh, pause again here to see if there are any questions before moving on to some um, best practices guidance. There is nothing in the chat. So unless anybody has something, I think we're ready to go. 
Excellent. Okay. So we wanted to focus today on um, categories and topics that we kind of see the most issues around or get the most questions about. Um, and so those include list tagging, glossaries, uh, table tagging, pagination tagging, write on lines, as well as uh, paragraph versus um, line break tags. So first list tagging. Um, in list tagging, the type attribute is not required for, for lists that include no numbering or bullets, such as um, a table of contents or index. However, for lists that do have bullets or numbering, there are three type attribute options. The first is unordered list or UL, then ordered list or OL, and then preformatted list or PL. The unordered list type, um, this tagging should generate a bulleted list in the accessible format. Ordered list tagging should generate a numbered list in the accessible format. And a, in a preformatted list, there's no numbering or bullets automatically supplied by conversion software when the NIMAS file is used. So instead, numbering or bullets are provided inside the list items should they be desired. Now, What's important here is that even though um, these tags are supposed to behave a certain way, we are aware of limitations in Braille conversion software. And so when you are trying to supply numbered lists in your NIMAS files, we strongly encourage that you utilize the pre-formatted list format. As you can see here on the slide, we sh we're sharing um, a very short example here with uh, three list items within the list. And inside the list item tags, you have uh, one, two, and three. So again, the preformatted list type wouldn't normally, it doesn't supply um, numbering or bulleting or anything like that unless it is included within the list items themselves. And a side note here that glossaries are a special kind of unordered list and they have their own tags and I'll touch on those in a little bit here. But again, due to limitations in Braille conversion software, rather than utilizing ordered lists, we do highly encourage that if you are trying to supply uh, numbered lists in NIMAS files that you utilize this PL, the pre-formatted list tag and include the numbering within the list items. Another uh, note here on list tagging. Please do avoid the use of paragraph tags inside of list item tags. Instead, you can use the optional list item component LIC tag if you wish to tag two components in a list item. So here we have two examples, both of which are acceptable in NIMAS. Um, the first here with just the list item tag, including both the entry as well as the, the page number or you can split those two pieces of information up within the list item tag using list item component tags. So in the second example, you have list item component tags around first the term and second the page number within a list item component tag. So either of these examples are acceptable for NIMAS. And one recommendation from the DAISY Structure Guidelines just to note here is that if you have more than two list item components in a list item, you may want to consider tagging the content as a table instead of a list. As I mentioned earlier, the ordered list type is not widely supported in the Braille software that uses NIMAS to create accessible formats. So we do highly recommend that you use pre-formatted lists instead and include the numbering inside the list item tags. However, if you do choose to tag using the ordered list tag, please don't also include numbering inside the list item tags. We do see this from time to time, and this would result in double numbering of list items if software does interpret the order list tag correctly. Um, and again, So again, that would just create duplicate numbering, and we, we don't want that in, uh, in the automated processes for utilizing NIMAS. Using internal links when tagging an index or table of contents is optional, but these can be very helpful when NIMAS is used to generate digital formats like EPUB and HTML. And again, links can be included with or without uh, list item component tags. So the first example here, um, 
again, you have one list item component tag, and within that tag, you have the term, and then um, the href tag referencing the page number, both nested just within the list item tag itself. Um, and then the second example, you have those two pieces of information split apart. You have the list item tag, and then separately provided in list item component tags, you have the term followed by the um, href uh, link to the page number. Now, glossary tagging is a little bit special. It uses um, a special definition list tag. Uh, DL tag in conjunction with the, the term and definition tags, the DT for term and the DD for definition tags. So um, the syntax here shows that you have the DL tag wrapping the list itself. And then within that, you have a DT tag around the term followed by the DD tags around the definition. And one thing that we do see from time to time, so we just want to send a quick reminder about this, is that the DL tags are intended to enclose the list, not the individual glossary entry. So each term and definition shouldn't be wrapped by a DL tag. The DL tags are for wrapping the list itself. So here's a sample glossary snip on your screen where you can see how um, this glossary is nested alphabetically, that's quite common. So you'll have um, the, the um, alphabetic division tag followed by a header of the letter, and then the DL tag below that. And the DL tag is wrapping all of the terms and definitions that fall under that alphabetic heading. So you have the DT followed by the DD for each term in the glossary. Now, as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, when you're looking at your tagging and trying to determine whether to tag something as a list or a table, one thing to consider is if there are two or more components to each list item, then it might be a more appropriate to mark up the list as a table. One example of this is that multilingual glossaries may be more appropriately tagged as a table to capture the complexity of the information. If you have any questions at all about how to best capture content in NIMIS tagging, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us for assistance. We may, um, depending on your question, sometimes we might ask if you can send us the, the a scan of the pages of the print book in question, and we'll take a look at that compared to um, how you are trying to approach the tagging and give you feedback based on that. Tables in NIMIS are marked up using the table element in combination with these tags, um, caption tags, if they're applicable, um, the T head tag, which contains the column heading row, uh, the T body tag is optional, uh, but includes the main body of the table, then you'll have the, the table row column, then the um, cell containing the column heading information, and then the TD, which is the cell containing the table data. And a key reminder here is that tables in NIMIS should be tagged as text in the XML. Please do not provide tables as images in NIMIS. This is something that we will give you feedback on. We will require resubmission um, to ensure that that text is tagged in the XML. Tables uh, that are found in K through 12 instructional materials might be simple or they might be complex. For example, some tables may include or may not include a caption or footer. Um, however, tables will commonly include column headings and this content should always be correctly tagged using the T head and TH tags. These tags are particularly important for navigation when NIMIS is used to produce digital formats like DAISY or EPUB. Um, we know that uh, table tagging and formatting is um, really essential and can be a rather complex step for uh, Braille transcription as well. So we would ask that you provide the properly tagged tables in the, uh, in the XML to try to um, help speed up that process as much as possible when producing Braille. So on the screen here, um, 
you'll see an example on the left, the original text of a, of a simple column. Um, and then on the right, you'll see how that should be tagged. So you'll see the T head tag here that contains um, the row with the headers. So um, you'll have parent company and divested business. Those are your, your headers for this uh, simple table that are wrapped in that T head tag. Then following that, you'll have each row tagged separately um, and then each uh, cell piece of data tagged in the TD column. So you'll see, um, and again, this is the simple example. Obviously, a lot of tables are more complex than this, but this gives you the basic concept of the overall uh, tagging structure for, um, for tables in NIMAS. There are additional examples and some more complex examples in the DAISY structure guidelines as well. Okay, uh, next let's talk a little bit about pagination. So pagination or page num tags are required for all NIMAS um, that is created for print materials. The page attribute should also be present on all page num tags. So you'll see here that page front is for Roman numerals found in the front matter, that page normal is for integer only pagination, and then page special is for any other content um, like alphanumeric pagination or empty page num tags as well. If the printed book has no pagination, page num tags are still required to indicate where there are physical page breaks. Um, we see this sometimes when we receive uh, less typical materials like uh, flashcards or um, files that contain posters or something like that where there's no actual pagination on the material itself, but there are page breaks. So unnumbered pages that are not within a numbered page sequence are tagged using an empty page num tag with a page attribute of special. And you can see an example of that on the screen here. So do, please don't use page normal with an empty page num tag. Unnumbered pages that are within the sequence of numbered pagination are tagged and numbered as if they showed a number on the physical page. So this might be a situation where all the odd numbered pages in the book um, don't have a page number present, but they are part of the um, sequence of pagination in the book. If you have any questions about pagination um, or how to tag page numbers as you're working on a, a specific file, especially one of those more unusual files, please, again, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to help with that. Another topic we wanted to touch on quickly are write on lines. So blank lines for students to write in. They're quite common in K through 12 materials, especially workbooks, but uh, we see them in the core instructional materials as well. There's not an XML element in NIMAS for write on lines specifically. So the best option is to use underscore characters within span tags to capture these lines. So these might be lines for a student to fill in their name and date, um, or they might be lines for actually, you know, answering questions. Um, and so you could tag these either with a span class write on line, WOL, or span class blank line, either way is fine and just provide those underscore characters within the XML. Now, while it's necessary to capture write-in lines in NIMAS, uh, it should not ordinarily be used to try to reproduce blank space on a page that's not meaningful. By and large, you're not trying to capture um, the actual layout of printed pages in NIMAS. Um, NIMAS tagging is semantic. so. The physical layout of printed pages, that's something if if a vendor is producing a large print um, or EPUB or something like that, then they're responsible for determining the physical layout of the printed pages. That's not something that can be captured in the NIMAS file. So please don't use uh, P tags to create empty space on a page. We will um, provide feedback on that if we do see that in your NIMAS files instead. Um, and if necessary, you can use line break tags uh, to capture line breaks, but use of this tagging should be minimal. All right, that was a lot of information on best practices. Does anyone have any questions about list tagging, glossaries? Um, tables, pagination, any of the things that 
we just touched on. I am not seeing anything in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, let's go into um, some optional pieces for NIMIS that are um, very important. And if you are providing them, there are some best practices guidance that we wanted to, to quickly cover with you. The first of these topics is alt text. Alt text is recommended but not required for NIMIS. However, the alt attribute must be present on all image tags. So the attribute must be present, but it can be empty in NIMIS. Um, if you are supplying alt text in NIMIS, it uh, should consist of a short phrase, no more than one to two sentences. If you are providing a longer description for a more complex image, uh, that can be supplied using the prod note element. We have pulled together some in image description resources. I think Alexa linked to our uh, image description resource document in the chat. So we would recommend taking a look at those, but we're also happy to assist if you have any questions at all. Again, um, alt text is something, it's actually one of the things that, that we gathered some input on this year to possibly uh, recommend be Come something that's required for NIMIS. Right now it's optional, but it is extremely beneficial, especially um, for NIMIS that's you uh, when it's used to produce digital formats. All text is extremely valuable. Now, the really important thing about alt text is that it should be good quality. Uh, alt text should be considered part of the curriculum, it's part of the instructional material. So we do strongly recommend that publisher staff uh, write or at minimum review any alt text that is supplied with NIMIS files. For alt text to be useful to students, it must be clearly written, grammatically correct, age appropriate, and relevant to the text. Something else that we do encounter from time to time that we may provide feedback on is depending on the nature of the material, this is especially can come up with math problems um, and um, you know visual um, like more complex math long answer questions that um, the alt text that's describing the math image may give away the answer to the question depending on how it is written. We may provide feedback on that as well if we do notice that as we're reviewing files. If alt text includes uh, spelling errors or grammatical mistakes, we will require that it either be corrected or removed from the file. So again, because not because alt text is not required at this time, if we do find that uh, your alt text has a lot of errors in it, one option is to just remove it. Um, but again, it is a valuable tool for students, and we do encourage publishers to look over any alt text that is supplied in your files and make sure that it is, again, age appropriate, that it's well written, that it's really another part of your curriculum um, because it is extremely beneficial. Now turning to MathML, um, again, MathML is optional. It's optional markup for NIMIS that makes math and scientific notation accessible. So instead of just providing your math content as images in NIMIS, um, this is tagging that allows you to include those math expressions in the XML itself. MathML 3.0 is the current standard, but MathML 2.0 can still be accepted for NIMIS. We have a guidance document called uh, MathML in NIMIS on our website, and I think Alexa put that link in the chat for you. Um, and it includes information shared in the following slides. And NIMIS files that include MathML must include the correct declaration at the top of the XML file. We'll see some examples of that in the next few slides. So this is the sample MathML 3.0 declaration here that is in the uh, MathML and NIMIS guidance document for you. So you can take a look at that. And then this is the sample MathML 2 declaration, uh, again, also 
available to you in that uh, MathML and NIMAS document as well. Now, even though the MathML tagging um, would provide those expressions, the tagged expressions in the XML itself, we do require that fallback images be provided for all MathML expressions um, in, your, in your file set. These images must be referenced in the OPF manifest as well. Um, and the fallback image file should also be 300 DPI. The fallback images are important for a couple of reasons. One is that not all software that's utilized um, to produce accessible formats from NIMAS can um, process MathML correctly or benefit from MathML. So in those cases, our accessible media producers will want to um, utilize those fallback images instead. They can actually download your files from the NIMAC uh, without the MathML tagging in the XML if that is their preference, and they would just um, download the fallback images instead. The other benefit to providing the fallback images is that they can be utilized in large print production um, because that uh, that tagging the MathML expressions, the tagging in the uh, XML files may not always be uh, processed correctly by InDesign or, or whatever tool our accessible media producer is using to produce large print and so that they would be able to then utilize the fallback images instead. And the alt image attribute is used to reference the image. So you'll see an example here. Um, and again, you'll also notice that that alt text um, attribute is, is required on these tags as well. Alt text is not required for MathML, just like it's not required for the rest of um, your images in your NIMAS file. However, the alt text attribute is required to be present on the math tag. So you'll see an example of that highlighted here. We would encourage you to leave the attribute empty unless you are providing a description of the equation, but please don't include placeholder text such as math um, or the image file name in, in that alt text tag. We will require um, you to remove that information and resubmit the file if we notice that that placeholder text. And that actually is um, also true for the alt text for your non-math um, fallback images as well. It is true that some images um, are really just decorative as part of your book. So something like decorative for some of the images in your book may be completely appropriate and correct, but we do occasionally see just filler, like the word image in the alt text attribute, and that is not correct. And we will require that that be removed if that is what we're finding in your NIMAS file. Okay, does anyone have any questions about um, MathML or alt text tagging? I'm still not seeing anything. Okay, great. Well, I know it's kind of early in the morning um, if you're on the East Coast like we are, so. If you think of questions later in the day, again, our email is nimus at aph.org. We're always happy to happy to help. Um, we'll go into some kind of final reminders for preparing your NIMAS files, and as well as highlighting a few more key resources that you may want to consult during your uh, NIMAS creation process. So our final reminder number one. Always transcribe the complete title page in the XML. I think I referenced this earlier. Uh, most software that uses NIMAS files ignores the doc title and doc author tags that you may include. So um, in addition to these required XML metadata fields, the complete contents of the title page should be transcribed in the XML. We know that that may feel redundant, but it's actually not redundant based on the way that soft software utilizes NIMAS. Um, when essential bibliographic information, such as the complete title, ISBN, the publisher imprint, um, or series or state edition only appear on the cover, then the cover must also be transcribed in the XML. Basically, what we want to see is that all of that essential bibliographic information, which is required to be present in the NIMAS PDF, as well as in your NIMAS metadata is also in the XML file itself. We want to see consistency across 
those three things. So the cover may also need to be transcribed in the XML if it is required to be submitted in the PDF because some of that essential information is only present on the cover. All right, final reminder number two, please don't include metadata in the XML head tag. Although Full Daisy does permit metadata to be provided in this element, it is not valid for NIMIS. Uh, metadata for NIMIS is provided instead in the OPF, as we've ta talked about, and the NIMIS specification calls for the head tag to be empty. Including metadata inside the head tags can delay certification. Um, it may, um, depending on your process, it may hold up um, your validation wizard from showing you any other information about um, the, the file that you're trying to validate if you include metadata inside that head tag. Final reminder number three, um, please check for and remove any extraneous files in your zip file. We know this is especially an issue for Mac computers um, that the way that they compress the file set uh, can result in an extraneous file included in the zip archive. These files will cause the file upload or validation to fail. Um, you cannot have extraneous files in your zipped folder. So please ensure that no additional Mac generated files are added to the zip file uh, after you zip it. And also be sure not to include any other file such as uh, a validation wizard screenshot in the zip file. We know that some um, publishers may ask for a validation wizard screenshot, or um, some of your custor customers may request some sort of uh, information like that, but please don't include it in your NIMIS file set that you supply to the NIMAC. The NIMAC has archived videos as well as downloadable PowerPoint presentations like this one on our website, and you're welcome to access them at any time. Uh, links to the resources referenced in this presentation can be found there, as well as additional downloadable resources like our part one presentation that's now available on our um, Publishers and Conversion Houses page on our website, uh, which you can find here. This is a, a screenshot of our NIMAC.us site. Um, we have a tab for specifically for Publishers and Conversion Houses. And on that main screen, you'll see uh, our part one presentation. And then you'll also see links to a couple of pages that uh, provide more of the resources that we've described, links out to those um, on uh, nested under publishers and conversion houses. So please do take a minute to explore that section of our, of our informational website. Additionally, to, to the resources found on our website, we have worked with staff at the National AIM Center to review and update their NIMIS-related resources. So the links uh, on this slide may also be helpful to you. Their resources on the AIM Center site, uh, including the, again, the NIMIS 1.1 specification. Um, some how-tos for creating NIMIS files, as well as some NIMIS exemplars that may be useful, especially there is one for um, MathML tagging for math tagging, as well as one for uh, creating digital instructional materials. Um, this is an area where I think there are there can still be a lot of questions as people are working on how to package and supply NIMIS for digital instructional materials. So um, if that exemplar on the site is not answering all of your questions, we do have an FAQ on our website that goes into digital instructional materials, but we are also happy to consult kind of on a case-by-case -case basis as you're looking at your materials and trying to determine how they should best be submitted to the NIMAC. Again, if you have any questions about anything I've talked about today, maybe you think of something later on uh, this afternoon, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our email is nimac at aph.org, or you can give us a call. Um, we are on the phones from 8 to 4.30 Eastern, Monday through Friday, and our number is 877-526-4622, and you're always welcome to leave us a voicemail, and we will get back to you. All right, and with that, I'll stop sharing my screen, see if anyone has any kind of last questions. I think we have a couple minutes left if anyone has anything.
And Alexa is also um, going to put in the chat a link to our exit survey. Uh, this is really important. We include these in all of our, of our trainings. It just takes a minute to complete and the feedback is really valuable to us as we are developing additional trainings uh, or informational resources for our website, um, as well as for our reporting back to the Department of Education from which we receive our funding. So um, if you wouldn't mind to please take a minute to complete that survey on your way out, we would greatly appreciate it. Let's take a quick look at the chat, see if anything popped up here. Oh, thank you for the kind words, Rebecca. Yeah, we're always happy to help. Um, you know, no matter where you are in the process, if you're a new publisher, learning the ropes and how to submit your first few files to the NIMAC. Um, you know, we're happy to help as much as needed. Or if you're, you've are you been around for a while and maybe you have a new program, you have some questions about metadata, maybe a customer has required your digital instructional materials to be submitted for the first time and you're not quite sure how to approach that, we're always happy to help kind of no matter where you are in the process. We get a lot of emails and we love we love them. We love emails, and we're always happy to happy to provide as much information as we can to support you guys. All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>